Good afternoon. As you know, I'm an anesthesiologist. I usually put people to sleep, but I hope not now, okay? So bear with me. As Richard said, this whole conference, we really are trying to point out how science is fluid, but sometimes science is quite flawed. There is nothing so powerful as truth, and often nothing so strange. Today, eugenics is thought as by some as a fringe movement that inflicted human rights violations on millions, but in its heyday, it was considered hard science. What is eugenics? The word comes from the Greek, you, well, and genics, born. Broadly, eugenics describes any human action whose goal is to improve the human gene pool, especially by selective breeding. We can chase, trace eugenics back to ancient societies to present-day reprogenetics, which includes preemptive abortions and designer babies. Now, there's negative eugenics, which discourages reproduction among those with hereditary traits that are considered unfit, the genetically disadvantaged. Now, this can be benign family planning, moving to forced sterilization, abortion, segregation of populations, and the extreme of genocide. Then there's positive eugenics that encourages reproduction of the genetically advantaged, healthy, intelligent people of high moral character. Now, there can be financial and political incentives for reproduction, in vitro fertilization, egg transplants, and the extreme of cloning. The key problem here is pretty obvious. Who defines the traits that are most desirable, and what do we do about them once we define them, and who are these people? There's some pros we can find to eugenics, really good reasons. It's our social responsibility to create healthier and stronger and more intelligent people. It saves scarce resources. Frankly, it was the lessening of human suffering that brought doctors into the fold. There are plenty of reasons against. Number one, it's immoral to play God. Forced sterilization and segregation violate civil rights. Disabled persons can succeed in life and what appears to be a genetic defect in one context is actually advantageous in another. For example, sickle cell anemia in the heterozygous form, protecting against malaria, and similarly with Tay-Sachs, protecting against tuberculosis. Plato was well known for his quest for a perfect society. He tried to mathematically determine genetic inheritance. He believed that human reproduction should be monitored and controlled by the state to get improvement of the human race. He wanted to have arranged marriages, but he knew the population wouldn't go for that. So he had a grand idea that might sound familiar. Hide the truth from the people. Pretend like you were having a marriage lottery, but then behind closed doors the government would fix the lottery. The city elders in Athens and Sparta actually examined newborn babies and decided who would live and who would die, then practiced infanticide to ensure that only the best babies survived. And in fact, in the Romans 12 Tables of Law, table number four said that deformed children should be euthanized. Eugenics is seductive. Who doesn't want a better society? Who doesn't want to reduce sickness? Sir Francis Galton of England is considered the founder of modern eugenics, and he was not a crackpot. Galton was a statistician. He discovered chi-square, regression and correlation. He discovered fingerprints and that they were unique in all people. He discovered the difference between fraternal and identical twins. But with regard to genetic, eugenics, he believed that talent and genius traveled on a gene and could be determined by heredity. And he reasoned that society could be saved from a reversion toward the mean 
by changing societal policies that protected the underprivileged and the weak. Now, Charles Davenport was the founder of American eugenics, and he's really credited with turning eugenics into a settled science. He was a well-known biologist from Harvard. He actually discovered the inheritance patterns of neurofibromatosis and albinism. But he again believed that complex human traits, such as talent and poverty, were controlled by a single gene and could be inherited in a predictable pattern, just like the seed coat of corn or cattle. Davenport actually formed the eugenics section of the American Breeders Association. His mission was to identify the most defective and undesirable Americans, at least 10% of the population. After identifying the submerged tenth, appropriate remedies would be used to terminate their bloodlines. The Eugenics Re Records Office collected hundreds and thousands of pedigrees that supposedly documented the heritability of criminality, epilepsy, bipolar disorder, alcoholism, and the catch-all term, feeble-mindedness. They didn't even consider social factors. There were prominent eugenic supporters all over the country, from University of Michigan, Harvard, Columbia, Cornell Brown, Northwestern, UC Berkeley, even the great American hero Charles Lindbergh. Eugenics and Davenport's methods were considered the latest in scientific modernism, and it attracted many liberals, and in fact, the most vocal critics were labeled as reactionary and anti-scientific. Where it gets scary is the Carnegie Institute supported report in 1911 had 18 solutions to the problem of the unfit. Point eight was euthanasia. Many mental institutions and doctors had innovative ways to practice passive euthanasia. In fact, one institution in Lincoln, Illinois, fed its incoming patients milk from tubercular cows, believing a eugenically strong person would be immune. Guess what? 40% of Lincoln's patients died every year. Of interest, euthanasia was really hot in the movies in the early 1900s, and one of my favorites was a movie called The Regeneration of Margaret. This was a story of a handicapped newborn who was tossed aside by the first doctor. A second doctor rescues her and raises her as his own. She grows up to become a nurse. She takes care of the first doctor who had tossed her aside. When he became paralyzed, she taunted him to carry out his own beliefs against saving defectives and to kill himself. Eugenics wasn't just eggheads. There were supporters all out in the streets, and these are folks carrying pro-eugenic signs, and there were seven to 10 a year of these fitter family contests where people would vie to have the best looking and smartest kids. Here's a poster from an international uh, con conference saying if all marriages were eugenic, we could breed out unfitness in three generations. Black supporters even bought into eugenics. W.B. Dubois said only fit blacks should procreate to eradicate the race's heritage of moral iniquity. The NAACP had its own fitter baby contest. The good thing that came out of it is it brought this concept of assimilationist eugenics. The talented tenth of all races should mix as the best blacks were as good as the best whites. So this actually brought on some racial harmony. This is somebody many people might recognize, Margaret Sanger, the founder of the American Birth Control League, the precursor to Planned Parenthood. She was a proponent of negative eugenics, that is, reducing reproduction of those who were considered unfit. And she believed that the weak should be allowed to die off. But eugenicists were not satisfied with just voluntary birth control. They brought the state into the picture. 
This is Harry Laughlin. He's considered the father of state-sponsored sterilization. In 1922, he published the Model Eugenical Sterilization Law. This law was based on the principle that sterilization was cheaper than caring for the descendants of the unfit. Segregation for, and care for life cost $25,000. Sterilization only cost $150,000. Hey, not a bad choice. The law authorized sterilization of the so-called socially inadequate. This included the feeble-minded, insane, criminalistic, epileptic, inebriate, diseased, blind, deaf, deformed, and dependent, including orphans, ne'er-do-wells, tramps, homeless, and paupers. And Congress, uh, ironically, Laughlin himself discovered that he had epilepsy one of the criteria for compulsory sterilization. So true. The 1927 Supreme Court case of Buck versus Bell put state-sponsored sterilization to the test. 17-year-old Carrie Buck was the first person chosen to be sterilized under Virginia's law. She had been in a state institution, likely because she was raped by friends of her foster family and they just stuck her away in order to hide that fact when she got pregnant. Her mother had been a prostitute, so she was considered to have the inherited characteristic of promiscuity. So it was fought, and at trial, these are the superintendent of the institution's words, not mine, said these people belong to the shiftless, ignorant, and worthless class of antisocial whites of the South. A sociologist and a Red Cross nurse examined Carrie's little six-month-old baby and decided the baby wasn't quite right. So the judge concluded she should be sterilized. The revered Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice, upheld the law, writing, Carrie Buck's welfare and that of society will be promoted by her sterilization. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. As it turned out, the baby was perfectly normal, and in fact was on the honor roll when she was in school. Carrie left the institution, got a job as a housekeeper, and a professor from Hopkins who visited her said she was doing crossword puzzles and reading books, so clearly she was not feeble-minded. Buck versus Bell has never been overruled. During the 1930s, 38 states had sterilization laws regarding the feeble-minded. In North Carolina, an IQ of 70 qualified somebody for sterilization. Between 1907 and 1963, over 64,000 people were sterilized under the eugenic laws of the United States. Before the death camps of World War II, the idea that eugenics could lead to genocide was not taken seriously. But the Nazis' use of eugenics for the extermination of Jews and other so-called undesirables brought on an anti-eugenic sentiment. But eugenics may not be dead. Now we go with genetic engineering that just started off as simple prenatal screening. James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA, really believed in eugenics, and he said, once you have a way in which you can improve our children, no one can stop it. So there's sort of a new definition of eugenics. The study of human genetics and methods to improve the inherited characteristics of the human race, also known as procreative beneficence, giving our children the best in life. So we've gone from simple prenatal screening to post-pregnancy screening. First, parents were screened for many of up to 400 hereditary conditions, Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, and the like. And then we had amniocentesis screening post-pregnancy for certain conditions in the fetus. 
Then we've moved on to pre-implantation diagnosis, and this is where the embryo is examined prior to implantation, looking for chromosomal aberrations or disorders due to a single gene. Now, there's about 3,000 of these so-called Mendelian diseases. So then the parent decides which embryo that they will implant. So this brings us to genetic engineering, and there's positive engineering, which tries to enhance the patient's genes, and then negative engineering, which removes genes that can cause disease. Now, somatic cell gene transfer is a negative genetic engineering, and it's been going on since 1990. And this takes specific genes and specific organs or tissues and modifies them. This is done specifically to treat or cure a condition. The important point here is this. This does not affect the eggs or sperm, and it doesn't alter a person's entire genetic makeup. Then we move to germline engineering. Now, we're not doing this yet, and you know, this slide is just something to keep your attention. Don't even try to read it. That this targets genes in eggs and sperm, or embryos, in the very early stages. The key method for doing this is mitochondrial therapy. And this is where you take diseased mitochondria and replace them with normal mitochondria from another egg, from a healthy egg. Put it in the embryo. The problem here is this crosses the line that doctors and scientists for a long time, they said they wouldn't cross. This creates changes in a person that will be passed down to future generations. And a real problem here is that if you make a mistake, then the mistake is permanent and it will get passed along. Then we move on. Let's see how this just keeps on cr creeping along to ooplasm transfer. Now, the problem and the distasteful thing here is that with ooplasm transfer, you are not trying to cure a disease. This is a technique to enhance fertility. You take the transferred material, proteins and RNA and the small molecules from a healthy ovum and put them into a woman with fertility problems. The fetuses have DNA of two women and one man. Currently, there's about two dozen babies who have been born this way, and the FDA stopped this in 2002. They're reconsidering starting it again, and the British National Health Service is actually reconsidering it. Uh, there was, in fact, just recently an article about one of the girls who was born this way. The people in the clinic that did this said a couple of the kids aren't quite right, but they don't know if that's because of the technique or they would have turned out that way anyway. You know, so who knows? Um, so this brings us to reprogenetics or designer babies. Reprogenetics is modifying embryos before implantation, not for health reasons, but for the sake of improvement. After all, isn't good health the best thing we can bring our children? Clearly, creating designer babies is not an abhorrent, an abhorrent concept. Last May, 13 members of the California State Assembly Health Committee voted down a bill that would have outlawed the practice of sex selection through abortion. There's a lot of cautions with genetic engineering on the physical level, just like with genetically modified crops, unforeseen consequences can develop. You lose genetic diversity and there's reduced ability to adapt to environmental change. On the philosophical level, the cautions are legion. Now, genetic modification has been defended as a moral imperative, but who will exercise control? Who decides which genes are defective? Who decides the genetic worth of prospective human beings? Who decides what is abnormal behavior? So many so-called disabling conditions can be viewed as empowering 
Florence Nightingale was bipolar. Many prolific authors, composers, and artists were bipolar. Worst of all, eugenics elevates the abstraction of the population above the rights and needs of individuals. Does this sound familiar? At bottom, genetic engineering can be considered just a modern version of the old eugenics doctrines. Instead of elimination of the unfit, genetic engineering is presented as a tool to end the suffering of genetic diseases. But how far will it go? In 1998, Princeton biologist Lee Silver wrote a book called Remaking Eden and developed the concept of the gen rich, that genetic engineering would create a new class of underdogs, the naturals. These were the ones who couldn't afford genetic enhancement and a small elite of the gen rich. Everyone wanting to be like this. But, <laughs> recognize anybody? <laughs> but if we don't watch out with selective breeding, we could actually end up like this. <laughs> this was done on purpose, believe it or not. Now, I was going to have this talk before the break. So there is a slide I put in here based on that. So you'll, I love the slide, so you'll have to bear with me. And pretend like you're going to take a break before our next wonderful speaker, but you're not. I'm no cook. <laughs> They said to let the bird chill in the sink for a few hours. <laughs> you all chill out. <laughs> <laughs> 